So, chapter seven of the of your textbooks, go all in one, the internet. Boom, boom, boom. All right. So, first, let's kind of start with a very brief, brief history here. All right. Uh, the, it's, the internet started as ARPANET. All right. Um, ARPA was the Advanced Research Progency Agency. I think net was just the end of it. I don't think there's anything there. But ARPA was the Advanced Research Project Agency. DARPA is the new ARPA is really what it comes down to. But this was a Department of Defense project back in the 1960s. And the goal was to create a communication system with multiple pathways. So a little bit of redundancy. All right. So if we can, if we look at our screen over here. So you can see we've got a few different devices. All right. And we're all plugged into the, the network. All right. And the network is going to be. Oh, that was a really bad line. There we go. All right. I just can't draw today, which is fine. But anyway, so we have our different um, our different devices on our network. And as you can see, depending on which, uh, depending on how you're trying to get certain places. So if you're trying to go from here down to there, you could go that way. Or you could come up to here, come down to there and go that way. So there was two different pathways for most of these. Obviously, the Utah one at the very top, you can see only one different link but there were four different nodes of that what this whole system started about and the really funny thing was the first time they actually tested this um they were able to send one character of the login username before the system actually crashed <laughs> at least that, that amuses me all right so it was not this beautiful perfect system and i mean most things when you first start them aren't a perfect this system all right but basically, the theory here is we have some redundancy. So if for something, someone happened to this network, we would still be able to communicate between all of them. So uh, the, only, the only one that couldn't didn't have redundancy was up here between SRI and Utah. All right. Um, those four nodes were at the University of California, Los Angeles, which is down here. Stanford Research Unifit Institute, which is there. Uh, Utah and Salt Lake City is that one. And then the, oh, sorry, that was over here. Utah, and then UT, uh, UC Santa Barbara, which is number three. All right. Um, so, and this was over, obviously, over large geographic distances. This wasn't like in one building. This was actually going out very, very, very far in the long run. All right. Um, and late in the 1970s, the National Science Foundation, you never hear that as NSF, um, conduct connecting university computers, science departments using the ARPANET technologies. All right, so it started in the 1960s and their 1970s they are starting to work on it. Um, in the 1980s, this network served as the internet backbone, which provided high speed connections between different networks. So this was the initial, you know, big bang, bad internet. All right. Um, now, for expansion purposes, that started in 1995. So not very, not very long ago at this point. Well, you know, under 30 years. Um, so you know, six. You know, I I was I was very much of a child at that point. My audio is not clear. All right, I don't know if that's just you or if that's everybody. So anybody else having audio issues? All right, so. 1995, internet was privatized. All right, so this went from being a DARPA project to be private, you know, privately owned, or at least different portions of it were privately owned. And a new backbone was formed with network access points in Chicago. So, um, yeah, Chicago and Indiana, New Jersey, San Francisco, San Jose, Washington, D.C. So as you can see, we're, we're getting really spread out all over the place. All right, um, and today the internet exchange points from the backbone and uh, are found throughout the whole world. All right, so this is just kind of expanded, expanded, and it's just, you know, it kind of took off like hotcakes. It's easy communication from one point to another. It was just, you know, best thing since sliced bread, per se, you know, if you want to go back to that old saying. Right, why did my slide? There we go. So, the internet. All right, so there is the internet and the World Wide Web, all right, or just the web. All right. Uh, we often are using these two as the exact same thing. And in fact, they're actually completely different entities. All right. However, we do that. We overall do com communicate them as the exact same thing. So, um, so the Internet is a network of computer networks. All right. Where the World Wide Web is, is um, only is only one on the is only one of the uses of the Internet. Sorry. 
All right, so the internet is what actually does all the connecting, all the backbones, and then the World Wide Web, what we typically see. You know, whenever someone says, oh, just go on the internet, it's really the World Wide Web what you're talking about. All right, um, so that is really the websites and those types of things that we are interacting with. So a little bit of a give and take going on there. Um, so the World Wide Web, or just the web, is a system of hypertext links that enables you to access information from different computers connected to the internet. All right, um, so... If you remember, you know, every time you ask for information, you know, this being you, it goes to your router, then it goes out to the cloud, and it probably makes a whole bunch of hops through the cloud, and then it comes back to someone else's router, which then goes to, you know, the server that you're actually asking for information from. Um, and again, there might be four, or five, ten different routers in here in this cloud section um, that it, it jumps to before actually getting to that server. So it really depends on where you're located and all those other fun things. All right. Um, however, so in other words, you have to ha use have the internet in order to use the World Wide Web. All right. So if you don't have an internet connection, right, your cell phone runs out of a data plan, you don't have an internet connection. You might have the internet, you just can't actually use it for anything, because AT and T, T Mobile, Cricket, whatever it is, your whatever your your cell phone supplier is like, nope, we're blocking your request because uh, your data plan's out, so you have to pay us some more money. You know, it's all a money thing. Um, but anyway. So the web is just one thing. You also might hear of the dark web, all right? Um, and, you know, if you ever look into that, you may hear that's like, oh, yeah, the humans only actually access, like, 3% of the web, all right? Um, so that's, you know, such a small group of websites that we can search. And if you think about how many websites there are that you can search, all right, that's a lot. Like, you know, 3% of that is only all we access? And don't quote me on the 3%, Mark. I didn't look that number up. Um but the dark web is, you know, much, much broader than that. And, you know, it's a place where you can do all sorts of creepy things and bad things and you know, things you shouldn't do and probably all that other fun stuff. So it is out there. How do you get into the dark web? I'm curious. And the answer to that is I have no freaking clue. I have never gone into it. The best I can probably point you to is the Tor, uh, Tor browsers, E-O-R browsers. Um, but basically, it helps anonymize your... The Tor browsers help anonymize your internet connection. Um, so whenever you have your Tor browser open, other people's requests are coming through your computer, and your requests are going through their computers, and it's it's just a mess. But I don't actually have any clue how to get to the dark web. I've just... We've read them and been reading about it. So, um, but yeah. So one of the uses we use the internet for is the web, is for us to actually um, you know, look up information, those types of things. Another thing, other things we use the internet for is email. All right. Um, I think we're going to come back to this one. I really uh, burnt, you know, feed this with a stick. Maybe not. Okay. Uh, so email. This is a asynchronous method of communication, also known as a store and go. Store and, store and go? Store and something. Um, but overall, so I write an email, I hit the send button. Um, someone said, or Tor browsers. Yeah, browsers. Sorry, reading my text. I type uh, my chat. Um, so email is asynchronous. Um, so that allows you to send a message and it basically just waits in you know some server somewhere until you go into that computer to access that server or you use your computer to access that server. So anytime you guys send me um, a uh, email to my, my work email, my HTC email, it goes you know to the HTC servers and it just sits there until my computer goes, hey, I need the emails for so-and-so. And it goes, oh, here they are. And it downloads them to my computer. And then I can respond and it sends them back. All right. Yes, we can do through this, this through the web. It's basically a small client running in the web browser, which asks for that information from the server. And the server then gives it to it, that client as on a temporary basis. And once you exit, in theory, it dumps all that information. So, um, so email is going to be an asynchronous type of thing. All right. You also have instant messaging. All right. This would be um, obviously instantaneous. So this would be more of a synchronous thing. So when I send an instant message to somebody, it goes from my computer in theory directly to theirs. All right. Um, so uh, Google Hangouts, uh, Apple iMessage, argue Facebook uh, messages, those types of things. Those are all more instant messages. AOL used to be the one, or AIM, AOL Instant Messenger, used to be like the go-to instant messenger. I can remember uh, logging into, you know, signing into the modem with that bad boy and uh, having internet access and being able to chat with people who were online. And once they logged off, you then couldn't send those messages anymore. You know, it was kind of kind of sad. And it kind of it actually extended almost more to the email where you could send those messages even if they weren't on the internet at that exact point. So 
there is a slight difference. The email is more asynchronous. All right. Instant messaging is more synchronous. All right. And again, synchronous means you know, everything's happening at the exact moment. I send it, you receive it. Email asynchronous means not all happening at the exact same point. So we are on a synchronous video call right now. We also have uh, P2P file sharing or peer to peer. All right. Um, and this what used to be like the Napster and those types of things. Everyone would illegally download their music and stuff like that from. Um, so it would be, you know, I'd have the files on my computer. And then when you'd say, hey, I want to download those files, my computer would be like, hey, here you go. And it'd send the files over to you. And then now you and I both had them. And then a third person wanted to download them. Um, it would go you know, to both of us. And you'd be like, hey, here you go. And I'd say, you'd say, it, and, you know, the third person would then start downloading the music file. And it kind of, you know, grew, grew, and grew. So even if I went offline, those files that I had still were available for other people to download. Um, so that peer to peer file sharing is a, is a big one. Um, Another great example of that of the Napster is uh, torrents. And torrents often do have a bad connotation. It's of a legal activity where, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I downloaded a movie from a torrent today. That's not what torrents are, you know, only purpose is. All right, now, that is what a lot of people use them for um, because, in theory, it is supposed to be a little bit more anonymized and it's not like just you broadcasting, I have this file, it's a whole bunch going on there. But there are other great uses for torrents um, for like um, image files for Linux things and stuff like that, where it is a readily available, normally open source type of file. And instead of having a one server located somewhere that you know, everyone has the access to download, it's a lot of upfront costs for a business to have that server and all the network connection, all those other fun things that people can download that. Having torrents where it's on my computer and your computer and Bob's computer and, you know, we're spread out all over the world. Now it's it's not having to come all the way over to the U.S. to download something. It's we're able to get it from the closest people. So we're able to have much better download speeds and those types of stuff. So um, what I said, that's another peer-to-peer -peer share. It often has a bad connotation. We also have voice over IP or VOIP, which is our um, IP's internet protocol. So this is our, our audio calls or phone calls, those types of things. Um, Skype would probably be the best known uh, voice over IP out there. Um, and Skype has obviously grown to include video chats as well. So kind of crazy. So voice over internet protocol isn't necessarily only the voice sound. It's sometimes it's audio. Google Hangouts can do it. Um, so Apple can do it. Google Facebook can do it. There's lots of stuff going on there. Um, what I have in the back here, background here, whoop, that chart um, is of the population of the, I think, U.S. population? I don't actually remember. Uh, and this is probably the whole world. Internetworldstats.com is where I got this from, um, which shows you that roughly the percentage population of people on the internet. And you can see how we've grown over the years from 1995 when it was first kind of, you know, the internet was a thing to where we are today. All right. Um, so obviously June 2020, or, you know, I think this is June, so July 2020. So we're still about a year behind at this point with stats, but roughly what, like 65? Four percent, maybe sixty-four, right, of the world is on the internet, um, which is kind of crazy. You know, we all, many of us, rely on it so much for everything, and we're doing a class through it right now. Um, that only, you know, such a small portion—not small. I mean, we're over half, but we're still not at three quarters of a percent. We're maybe at five eighths. So, not a whole lot in the long run um, is happening there. But you know, there's a lot, a lot of people who are on the internet. There's still millions of people who don't have internet access. And that causes all sorts of problems for te online teaching, um, for vaccine distribution, for like COVID right now. Um, having internet uh, is oftentimes how a lot of these places are getting the people who are allowed. You know, if you're in the right group, you can then sign up. Most of the time it's done through the internet. So if you don't have it, it's very hard for you to then get signed up to go get it. Um, and this has actually probably been a big issue for the elderly for the most part, I mean, if you think about it. Um, you know, the elderly, elderly people who are, you know, were mostly are on the, like, stage one of the, you know, like, oh, you're 65 and over or whatever, you can get the vaccine if you want it. Um, but many of those don't have the internet, don't know how to use the internet well, you know, those types of things. So they're relying on other people, so, or, for you know, news, they don't, you know, it's just bad at that point. So, kind of kind of crazy that we're only at 65%, but it's causing all sorts of pro uh, problems in the long run. Now, HTTP, this is something that you guys probably use every freaking day. 
uh, and you don't even realize it. All right, you used to have to type in the entire URL that you wanted to go to. So it'd be HTTP colon slash slash www.google.com. That's what you used to have to type in. All right, um, and HTTP was the hypertext system. So this is a protocol, all right, um, for how to get information is what it comes down to. So you had FTP, you had HTTP. Those are probably the two most used ones that I know of. Um, so if you didn't put HTTP, I was like, well, what protocol are we using? And it wouldn't know. Maybe it would guess and put HTTP on the front and hope for the best. But it's still, uh, it's still there. It's still, um, you know, type of thing that does exist. But unless you're specifically looking for it, like, you know, you got your, you click on the link and you copy it or something like that, oftentimes it doesn't even show up anymore. Um, so let uh, me. I want this button. So hopefully you guys can see it up here, but like, you know, without me having clicked on it, it shows me a lock and it shows me elpenbellum.com, which is where, you know, our class is. But I click on it, it doesn't always even, but double click, you know, now there it is. There's the HTTPS. And notice we're actually missing the old www still, which is kind of an interesting thing. So something to be aware of in the long run. So, uh, but anyway, it was a uh, hypertext system was developed in 1991 by Tim Bernays Lee of CERN. All right, um, and it's, it's the basis of the World Wide Web. So you, you're probably using it without even knowing it. Um, this is a system that links together text and other objects such as photographs and video in a nonlinear fashion. So it's what allows us to have the website. Um, and man, it used to be that the the that HTTP was the the like file type that you'd be looking at those types of things and. We've grown drastically since then. There's all sorts of different things. Um, your your device that you're on, your browser knows what type of device you're on, which means your website loads differently, whether you're on mobile or on a computer, or whether you have a small screen or those types of things. So, and you know, everything is dynamic, and not everything, but most websites are dynamic now. So as you make them wider or taller, you you know, the website alters its appearance ever so slightly. So that way you have a better view of what's actually going on. And, you know, it's like, oh, you have more screen here. We're going to put more stuff on there for you and make it more useful or easier use. It'd be the better way to phrase that. So um, now on websites are hyperlinks. And this is a link from a hypertext file or document to another location or file. And we're typically activating that by clicking on the highlighted word or image on the screen. You are all probably used to this being like the blue text that's underlined. All right. As soon as you type a, a URL in somewhere, normally you hit space after it and automatically pops up, becomes a hypertext. All right. Now, hypertexts are not limited just to the internet. All right. You, most websites, yeah, they're hypertext living data tab. And it's like, oh, yeah, well, here's, some, here's a news article. And here are our links to where we got the information. And you can click on those links and they take you to wherever they got the information. So if you want to read more or make sure the information you're getting is actually accurate, you can go do that. However, we can also do um, hyperlinks in like Word documents or PowerPoints is another great one. If you've ever played a game of Jeopardy in PowerPoint form and they have the back button and you know, things like that, that's just the hyperlink that takes it says, oh, go back to slide three. That's all it is. Uh, so kind of crazy that we can do those types of things, not just on the Internet, but also in smaller programs and things like that. Um, and the hyperlinks are obviously going to show up. Yes, somebody texted me, HTTP has no security, HTTPS does. If you notice, that's my last bullet on the screen. So uh, we're going we're gonna to come back to HTTPS. All right, um, so websites on the internet. These contain hyperlinks, which may link to other web pages or on the same site or in other, on other sites on the World Wide Web. All right, again, you know, you're reading a news article and it's like, oh, you, do you want to read more about this topic? And you might take you to a whole different website or maybe posting going, hey, that our article introduced uh, in, you like that article read this one as well and it's trying to encourage you to come back to read more stuff on their website so they can display more ads for you and those types of things ads and oh i highly suggest ad blockers personally I, they just they're just so annoying anymore but anyway um so in 1993 one of the most significant advances in the World Wide web occurred when mark anderson and his students released a graphical browser that made the internet much more user friendly all right Remember, this is GUI, graphical user interface. All right, so what when the internet used to be all just text, right? And you had to read through it and all those other fun things. Um, however, we are at a point now where everything is graphical, right? If it's not graphical, people don't want to use it. And I highly suggest that you guys try, if there's a non-graphical option, try it out. 
Will it take you a little bit longer to learn the system? Yes. But once you learn it, oh, it's so much quicker to work with, right? Like, oh, if I just type this, I can do that. If I type this, I get this. And man, you can just bang through different tasks and things like that. So going back to the old text-based command line PowerShell, if you're, if you're on Windows command line or PowerShell, um, on Linux terminal, those types of things, ah, you can get so much more done in a non-graphical interface. As I said, it does take a little bit longer to get used to. Um, and this was one of those things. Uh, I worked at CVS. And for the longest time, our um, like when we had to count the tills, the drawers out at the end of the day or things like that, it was all text-based. And there, were mouse, there was a mouse on the computer because there was a part of the system, which it almost seemed like you know person A developed this system for CVS. And then um, that person died or fired or whatever. And person B was hired to do another part. And they said, well, we don't feel like integrating into his system. So we're just going to have a link that takes us to a different website-based system. And that was so annoying. But, um, but yeah, so if you ever have the opportunity to try to learn a textual-based system with PowerShell, command line, terminal, give it a shot. It's so much nicer once you learn the system and you're like, oh, I, I need to change something. You can just... You know, do a little quick typey type and you're done. So I highly suggest that. All right, now the other thing with websites is like we are talking about it, mobile devices have made the internet even more accessible. All right, not just because of mobile internet, but because uh, many people have a cell phone in their pocket. All right, you can get a very cheap cell phone. All right, now a very cheap cell phone, you know, something like that. All right, I mean, this is a Samsung, I don't know what it, it is, it is an old old device but you can get devices like this where you can get on the internet you know on wi-fi you don't have to have a mobile data plan and this is like almost more accessible for people than having to buy a full computer all right um you know even chromebooks right now they're two three hundred dollars where a cell phone where you already have it has internet or it has wi-fi you can get on the internet with it so it's actually made it more accessible for people which is really quite nice um now, that also has some other issues with, you know, screen real estate and things like that, trying to get, read the information, and I don't know about you guys, but overall, I hate reading that on, you know, lots of stuff on a cell phone. Now, you have to, you're just constantly just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. All right. Uh, it's gotten better now with our larger screen phones, right? You know, if we look at that phone versus that phone, you guys are probably, like, anyway, you know, you can see that the difference. This phone, this screen is as wide, you know, as tall as that one is wide. So this one's probably like three times bigger. All right. So things have gotten better, but man, carrying some of that big around your pocket and whatnot, not the favorite thing in the world. Really miss this cell phone. This was the phone that I could beat the living daylights out of, and it just kept on going. The only thing that died on it is the battery, which is the way the game works with cell phones. Right? Can't take the battery out anymore. Anyway. And the other thing I want to talk about is HTTPS, as somebody posted in, in the text to me. Yes, all right. HTTP does, is not a secure thing. That means our data there is not encrypted, which means anyone who can, can collect is in a man in the middle. If your information is getting passed through them to get out to the internet, they're able to actually read what information and requests and things like that are being sent. So, uh, you, you know, your request for information from Google or Amazon or, you know, you're not those, but... You know, random websites that aren't secure, they can go, oh, they want to know this information. And they can actually, especially if they're they're taking your data and passing it through, they can modify that data, set other requests. All right. Um, and a proxy is one of those things that does that. So, um, you know, it's like your proxy was saying, hey, I want looking for information on this website. And my website goes, no, they actually want information on this website. Uh, back when I was in high school, one of my friends had a proxy server running at his house. And uh, anyone who used it, could not access Facebook. He, he, was, he, he hated Facebook for some odd reason. So he set it up that anyone who tried to access that would get that redirected like MySpace or some other website, uh, which was kind of hilarious. And a lot of people go, I want Facebook, not MySpace. And, you know, his, his server basically just like, nope, you're getting MySpace every time. So, um, however, if you do a secure, you know, the HTTPS, it, which it actually does ensures data security over the network. All right. So um, this is all about protecting your data from being eavesdropped on. So HTTPS encryption is done bidirectionally, which means that the data is encrypted at both the client and server sides. 
So as you request data from the server, you're sending it encrypted. As they send data back to you, they're sending it encrypted. So everything is secure. And in theory, theory at least, no one else can read it. Um, just because in theory no one else can read it doesn't mean they actually can't. So that is something to be aware of. But this is not one of those things that is being mass, you know, the encryption is being mass broken on, at least that I'm aware of. So, um, so this does protect against eavesdropping. And this may not be super important at your home network, right? You know, if you're on your own Wi-Fi and you're, you know, sending data off with your credit card information to like Amazon, might not be super important there. But man, when it does become important is when you're on like public Wi-Fi and things like that. All right. There's uh, something in the, the cybersecurity world called the, the evil stepsister, the evil twin, something along those lines, which basically is um, you have a, a Wi-Fi network that is masquerading as another Wi-Fi network that is unsecured, say Starbucks. And since everyone's phones are already, not everybody, but anyone who goes to Starbucks probably connects to their Wi-Fi at some point, their phone automatically connects to the Wi-Fi at Starbucks. Um, so if I have an evil twin thing going on, I don't even have to be at Starbucks. I just have to be somewhere, and I could have a Starbucks Wi-Fi access point, and your phone, as long as it's not already connected to another Wi-Fi thing, would be like, oh, it's Starbucks Wi-Fi. Let me get on that for you. And it just pops on it like there's no question. All right. Um, and at that point, any request that you send through that is not encrypted, not an HTTPS, um, I can then collect that. I can go, oh, they asked for information on this website. And there's, like, th these devices that can do this readily available you can just purchase one if you want um I don't do it really what it comes down to but it is readily available and it's really a, a kind of a neat thing the web the, the demonstrations i've done um it's like they it's you know it's basically a, a router that you connect to one router one wi-fi network and then you, you distribute wi-fi on another name um and then any web, website that someone goes to that's not secure the device shows you a website and you can click on all the different devices and requests that are being sent and you can actually load like see what was loaded that they what information they got back and they could see what they were clicking on those types of things yeah crazy and this is you know something that you can just go buy right now however you feel like it it's, you know yeah not really a good thing so https i think is actually becoming a bit more common now even on some websites that don't in theory actually need it um i think google was even a secure Yep, Google Search is secure. It is HTTPS. Does it truly need to be? Probably not, but it is a, as a secure connection there. Um, so just one of those things to kind of keep, keep in the back of your mind. Hopefully your bank websites are uh, secure connections um, and those types of things. So you know, there's many websites that should be secure, and there are many that it doesn't really matter. You know, If you're just reading a news article on CNN, let's see. CNN, even CNN H has is HTTPS at this point, you know, um, Fox News. You know, a lot of these bigger companies are going, well, you know what, we're going to secure information, so uh, make people's life a little bit better. So a lot of them are doing that HTTPS, even though they they might not necessarily um, actually be. So. Um, all right, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot that can go on out there with the whole, like, uh, evil twin attack and things like that so if you guys are interested go look a bit more um and if this is the type of thing that actually interests you maybe your cyber security is the type of route you want to go so uh, why don't you look into our cyber security program um if you're if you really are interested let me know and i'll happily uh, pass your names on to our cyber security teachers so all right now this leads us to our isp all right now isp is your internet service provider all right if you guys have internet at your house you have an isp all right um locally you're probably looking at antietam cable maybe comcast um i don't think there's much verizon going on around here so those are our big internet service providers our, our local hagerstown area um so something to, to look into um your ISP provides an access path to the internet, all right? Um, so, again, right now I'm on the screen. I got a little picture of a little PC pointing to the ISP, which goes in the internet. Remember, it's not just your PC. There's, you know, everyone in your neighborhood, sister, brother, you know, whoever is around sends their information to the ISP, which then gets forwarded to, to the actual internet, all right? Um, your choices are affected by where you live. So I know I rambled off a few. Um, Verizon Fios is one, um, Comcast, and Antietam. Um, there's some satellite based stuff. There's even actually wireless ones now. Um, there are some wireless ones local where um, 
they've got basically like a, a cell phone antenna with you know um, directed beam antennas that go certain areas so as long as you have no obstructions around you you can actually get on the wireless you can connect to those wirelessly uh, there's a guy i watch on youtube called crazy boat guy he lives on an island i think down in panama or something and they've got basically a little satellite dish on the roof of his house so it's not going it's not satellite it's, he's not going up to the, the atmosphere no he's pointing in a very specific direction it's just a standard rf link just it's a very focused link in that way that's how he gets his internet so there are wireless options that don't necessarily go up to satellites um now Another question is how much bandwidth do you need, right? Um, so at home, like Antietam, they have a 10 megabyte down, one megabit up connection, which is probably plenty for most people, all right? Um, at the whole start of this, I upgraded to uh, 50 meg down, 5 megabyte up, uh, because you know, when it came to uh, uploading videos and things like that, I was like, you know, I really do need to have a better internet connection. Uh, right now, I'm sending a 380 yeah, 400 kilobits up, and I'm receiving 8 to 16 kilobits down, which actually is rather interesting. Google Drive should still be starting right now. That's one. Uh, anyway, so, you know, we do have that going on. Um, so I'm not using a lot of data right now when it's just, you know, video call or with this video chat. I mean, I'm sending, you know, almost half a meg at some point. So that 10 meg down, 1 meg up would be plenty for this for this video call. Um, but so when it comes to like uploading videos and things like that, when you're uploading maybe a gig, gig and a half video file to YouTube or something, definitely uh, high, the more uh, bandwidth, the better. All right. Now, the other thing is you may be going, why do we have such a difference, right? Why do we have 10 down and one up? Like, you know, it's a 10 times difference. Even your 50 down, five up, that's a five, 10 times difference. Why do we have such a, a crazy difference there? And the reason is most people are downloading. They're not uploading. All right. Um, now, this is kind of changing with uh, the whole Web 2.0 thing, which we're going to come back to in a, in a few slides. Um, but most of the time, most of what you're doing is you are bringing information onto your computer. You're not actually sending that much information back up. And since there are a limited number of channels of, of frequencies and things like that that we can transmit along a, a specific cable, they, they had to pick a, a, an option. It's like, well, what, where do we need the, inf you know, where do we need more bandwidth? Do we need more on the upload side or more on the download side? And, well... They picked the, the download side. So that's why most of us have like a such a, an offs, you know, offset of so much higher download than upload. So that is definitely something to, to look into. Um so cable internet access. Ooh, come back to that. All right, so we already talked about uh data connections. Um high, the higher numbers, the better off you're gonna be over in the long run. Um so you gotta you gotta that's a give and take there, you know. A 10 meg down, one meg up with Antietam, I think was like 60 bucks a month or something. A little ridiculous in my opinion. That's that's horribly expensive for what I'm getting. All right. Um, but since Antietam was my only cable option, it was like, well, that was what I was stuck with. So definitely be something that you be aware of. Um, before all this, you know, before we had these uh, cable internet or DSL or fiber or satellite or mobile, uh, we had good old dial up. All right. And. Hopefully you guys were around with dial-up and your 56k modem and hearing the wonderful you know, screeching noises coming out of your computer as AOL tried to connect to the network and those types of things. Or if someone picked up the phone while you're on it, um, it's because it was sending data over basically waveform. So some of that was audible. So um, dial-up connections do use regular phone lines. So you have to have a phone line and a dial-up connection to connect to. So again, kind of something to be thinking of there. So for our broadband internet, we have a few options. So we have cable internet, all right? And this is a form of broadband internet access, which uses the same infrastructure as cable television. All right, so that coax cable that you just screw onto the back of your TV from way back when, that's where cable internet access is, basically. All right, you do also have, oh, you can have speeds, according to my quick research, was up to 2,000 megabits per second, uh, bits, not bytes, so uh, roughly two gig bit. Network section, uh, network connection, which is kind of crazy. Um, average US speed in the US over for cable and access, I don't know from when, but was uh, 55 megabit per second. So still pretty good speed. I'm actually a little bit lower than that still, but again, that's plenty for what I do. Even I could be doing my, you know, I can be uh, video chatting with you guys down here. My wife can be upstairs, um, you know, watching YouTube videos or whatever with my daughter if necessary, or on the phone or, you know, whatever the case is. So. I've got plenty fast enough internet, but 
it all comes down to what are you trying to do and how much you're willing to pay. So, um, next we have DSL or Digital Subscriber Line. So this is a family of technologies that are used to transmit digital data over telephone lines. So uh, an old dial-up was still analog. So it was actually again those those waveforms, those, ee, those horrible noises. So you actually in theory recorded that and you could play it back with, through a, some sort of device. You could actually again detect what they were doing at that exact moment, like what data was being transmitted, and all those other things. Uh, but DSL is doing it digitally, not analog. So something to uh, be aware of. Uh, uh, this, for me, is actually again according to my research, was up to 100 megabits per second, which I thought was actually kind of fast for DSL. Normally, I think uh, DSL is a bit on the slower side than that, but this says up to, so that would be your, your absolute max, um, where you know. So we can get 20 times faster over cable than DSL. Something to think about. Another option is fiber to the home. Verizon Fios may be the best known one for this. Um, it's one of those commercials where you know, kids and the dad are outside and they look at the box. And there's all this light shining out of the box, the cable guy. And dad's like, whoa. The kid's like, you should see his truck. Yeah. Uh, that was the fiber to the home option. And again, I think my, my numbers here, this says up to 1,000 megabits per second. I think you can go much, much higher than that on this, but I could be mistaken. All right. Now, typically, this so far has been copper. That's the, what we send our kick signals over is copper. DSL is copper. Fiber traditionally is actually going to be glass, which is really interesting. So this is using light pulses instead of electrical signals to send your information from point A to point B, um, which to me is really, really interesting interesting technology of just sending you know, data from via light. Um, and there, there's all sorts of technology based on light for transmitting information. Um, but um, so fiber, traditionally, we're actually going to send over a special glass wire, all right, with some coatings and whatnot around it to protect it. There are um, fiber optics that use optically clear plastic instead of glass. Um, they're going to be cheaper but they're not going to be as, I think, resilient. So I think the, the plastic will shatter and, tra and have um, signal transmission issues and stuff like that before the glass would. Another option is um, satellite internet. All right. Um, so again, this says you can have up to 100 megabits per second. That was the Visat um, network connection. At least that was the company advertising that one. I looked it up. Um, there's another bigger one now, which... Um, which are a bigger company now. You all probably heard about this in the news and they're starting to completely destroy our skies for looking at stars and things like that. But uh, Starlink from Tesla, or from, from Elon Musk, not Tesla, Tesla took a part in that. But Elon Musk and his Starlink internet access, all right? Um, he is putting a whole bunch of really small satellites up in the sky instead of really large ones. Um, and they're actually getting decent speeds right now. now it's, it was... Last I noticed, it was still currently on test, you know, beta users and things like that. And I think it was $100 a month. And depending on how many people are accessing the satellites at any given point in time, that is um, what's dependent on your network speeds. If you're the only person on that network, you can get crazy awesome speeds. If there are a lot of people accessing those little satellites, your internet speed may be jump. So a lot of give and take there. Again, there's only such a limited amount of data that they can send back from the satellite back down to the ground, you know, max speed. Um, so, and it's going to be much slower than running it over a cable wire. So, um, but, so we've got copper, we've got some fiber optic glass, we've got wireless, and then we have another wireless option with our mobile internet access. So this is going to be using your cellular networks, um, either through your cell phone or through hotspots or those types of things. Um, so, you know, you, many cell phones can become hotspots, so you can actually turn your, your cell phone into a Wi-Fi access point that your laptop can connect to. Um, I do like to always point out that your either like a desktop computer using a desktop web browser or even a laptop with a web with a web browser the amount of data being sent i think is a lot higher on that type of device than you do on your mobile device i think there's a lot of compression and fanciness that happens on your mobile devices to help you save um, data on your mobile plans where on desktops and not might necessarily be the case so you do want to be very careful using um, your mobile internet access on your cell phones because of you know just the cost alone so Something to be aware of. But some people, this is all they have. All they have is a cell phone. They've got a little Bluetooth keyboard or mouse or something so they can type away on it. And, and that's all they need. Do each their own. Um, there's some other options. So we also have Wi-Fi hotspots. I mean, man, you know, almost anywhere you go now has a Wi-Fi hotspot. Almost any business, I guess I should say, has some sort of Wi-Fi hotspot. It may be secure. You may have to ask for the password. And 
truthfully, that's the better type of Wi-Fi hotspot that you want to be getting onto um, compared to like Walmart, again, because of that evil twin attack that could be happening at Walmart. You do want to be a little bit careful there. Um, so services, um, you know, at locations like schools, libraries, um, things like that. You also might have municipal Wi-Fi in your area, all right? And this is traditionally going to be like in large cities or something. You know, if you're walking around downtown Hagerstown, I don't know if there is or not, but they'd have just Wi-Fi around for you to be connected on your phone. Um, and again, anytime you connect to somebody else's Wi-Fi, you are giving them information, whether you know it or not. Um, and one of those pieces of information you're like in a, in a city setting is where you're located roughly right um they know if you're on connected to this access point you're within 300 feet of that access point and if they keep track of how you jump from access point to access point to access point to access point all of a sudden now they can figure out kind of roughly where you were and where you're going and all those other fun types of things so you do want to be careful about using other people's wi-fi um, it's often suggested that you use a VPN anytime you're using a um, unsecured Wi-Fi because of the worry of that evil twin attack. Um, and a VPN will protect you from that man in the middle attack because you're directly talking to a server and everything's being encrypted that way. So even your unencrypted HTTP requests are going to go from you to a server somewhere encrypted and then from that server out to the internet unencrypted. So it is protecting your information in those. So a VPN is a great idea. Web browsers, I have some of the big ones. All right, um, Opera is actually one. It is a big one, but it's not as used. Chrome, um, I'd say Firefox. Circle these. Firefox, Chrome, and Safari. I would say are probably the biggest three. Um, Internet Explorer is basically dead. Windows, I think, has stopped supporting that in the long run. Um, Microsoft Edge is the new, the new kid on the block, I believe, from Microsoft. I, I, now I'm realizing it's under my little picture, which is fine. Um, but I think, I think it's actually based on Chrome or something along those lines. Um, Bing. What about Bing? Bing is a search provider. It's not a web browser. So, slight differences there. Um, but anyway, um, web browsers provide navigation buttons to move between web pages, address bars for you to type information your address into, favorites or bookmarking, so returning to pages, um, tab browsing, which enables you to have multiple web pages open with, without having multiple windows open, um, settings or tools for controlling the web browser um, for like cookies and things along those lines, um, capability to reload web pages, so lots going on there. Um, websites are based off of HTML. Well, I was slightly talking about that earlier. I screwed up a little bit. HTML is the the old language of um, of websites. So if you ever made a, a website, you probably old school. You had to make an HTML code. You had to code it in HTML language and all those other fun things. Um, we've we've definitely gotten a bit away from that and come a long way. Um, mobile browsers are going to use smaller screens. Um, I highly suggest that you guys pick your own homepage, which I actually found really neat on Google's recently. Um, that if yeah, there we go. Um, if you use Google's homepage, right, or if you just use nothing on Google, just the default, whatever, uh, they actually now have the capability for you to add shortcuts down here, which is kind of nice. So kind of one of those interesting things that I just recently saw. Also, for those who don't know, the, the picture on the Google homepage, A, changes every day, and B, is traditionally oftentimes interactive. So you can also find, like play silly games or things like that. But this is also uh, specific to like the day of the week or the day of the year. So if you click on this, it's, it's I can't even say her known, um, but it's all about that person. So something interesting to, to look into. Um, you also have extensions, which enable you to further customize your browser with add-ons or plugins. All right. Um, and every web browser calls this like something. Some are add-ins, some are plugins, some are extensions. So you really got to just, you know, kind of keep your brain open to those facts that they're all different. Um, but like, um, yeah, um, ad blockers, those types of things are extensions. All right, someone says Google has too much leverage on the entire world, and I don't like it. I agree, Google has is a, such a monopoly, but they're not the only option out there. So don't use Chrome if you don't want to. I don't blame you. Don't use Google Search or anything else. Um, but yeah, so extensions allow you to add things and capability. It may be that you want to be able to capability to save websites. It may be that you want to have ad blockers, uh, VPNs, um, those types of things. So there's lots of different extensions out there um, for you. And it really comes down to which which ones do you want. And it's always I always find suggest that you guys go look through those extensions. There's are really neat ones out there. 
we get into the basics of the URL, uh, there are three or four parts overall to it. So we have URL is the Univer Uniform Resource Locator. All right. So this is what you're going to put in the address bar to go somewhere. Typically, we're going to um, start with HTTP or HTTPS. All right. Again, so it's whether it's secure or not. All right. And that is the protocol. So this is the language that we're talking. How we're, how we're going to request information and how we're expecting that information to be brought back to us. Um, so, yeah. Then next we have our domain name. This is follows the protocol and represents the company, product, or person represented by the web page. So as this term, it's, point, it's uh, tech target is the domain name with another subdomain right in front of it. All right, so you can actually do that. You can have little subdomains in front of things. Uh -huh. um, so, and then we have the top level domain, which is this last little bit right here. Uh, which gives you an idea what type of site you are accessing. So it used to be you had like com, edu, and gov. All right, those used to be the only options, at least in the U.S. However, that number that has just like bloomed crazily. Now you've got gov and info and this. And, oh, you got there's two damn options out there. Anyway. Um, so they used to be very specific, but now it's kind of gotten away. So com used to be commercial, edu for education, and gov for U.S. government type things. And if you're going to other locations, you might see .co.uk, so .co.uk. Um, that would be a U, uh, UK site and all those other fun things. And then we have our path at the bottom. And you might see multiple paths. So you might see glossaries, slash info, slash blah, 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 you know, all, all this end stuff down here. So you might have uh, more paths going on there than you expected. So. Um, or, and then you might also have a file name at the end. So it might say dot something. Dot lot going on there. So how it works, all right, we have the ICANN or the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. So this coordinates the Internet Domain Naming System. Now, the Domain Naming System or DNS, all right, that's very important. Anytime your computer is requesting information, first thing it does, you say, I want to know, I want to go to Google.com. First thing it does is it sends a HT request over here and says, hey, I'm sorry, up top, pointed that one the wrong way. It goes, hey. Where is Google.com located? And then the DNS will go through its little phone book and say, oh, uh, Google is located at this IP address, 8.8.8.8 or whatever it is. All right, that's actually Google's DNS server for those who are curious. All right, um, and that sends information back. So instead of you having to remember that, oh, Google is located at 8.8.8.8 or Amazon's at 172.56.32.148, we just type in Amazon and it goes through DNS server. And the other benefit here is if Amazon, in this case, has multiple web servers, which they do, all right, depending on where you're located, you're going to access a different Amazon web server. Um, the DNS servers in those different areas will direct you to those different DNSs. So it'd be like, uh, you're located here. Oh, you want this Amazon. Oh, you're located there. You want that Amazon. All right. So it actually provides us a way to have the same name actually represent multiple different IP addresses. Very convenient. It also allows us that if that one Amazon that you normally go to is down, it can redirect you to another one. So, um, so after you get that information back about your DNS, but where that thing is located, it then sends a request via that IP address to your server that you're trying to get. And the HP response says, okay, I got a request from this IP address, and I'm going to send it back. All right, and again. So an IP address is um, are a series of numbers that you can type them in the address. Uh, so basically just a series of numbers. Currently, we're on a um, IPv4 for most things, IP version 4, which is 4 8-bit numbers. All right. So in case you're not curious, no, if you don't know, 8-bit means that any num one number can be between 0 and 255. So we are uh, rocking 32 bits for IP addresses. Um, IP version 6 has come out, and I think that's a 64-bit. I read that off the top of my head. But anyway, um, it, it skyrockets the number of possible addresses is what it comes down to. So IP version 4, only 32 bits, and we're running out of them is really what it comes down to. So for, for home use, IP version 4 will always be fine. Um, when we start getting into the, the World Wide Web with how many different servers and things like that are on the Internet, we're running out of IP version 4 addresses. Oh, you have to be very careful of that. All right. Um, yeah, so and all this is happening in the background. Like, you don't have any idea this is happening. And you still get that response from Google within milliseconds, which is absolutely nuts, or Amazon or whatever website you're trying to access. For online communications, we did have this later. All right. 
Um, so we already talked about instant messaging as being a synchronous type thing. Some examples for that would be Facebook Messenger, Google Hangouts, AOL, Apple iMessage. We already hit up voice over IP, Skype and FaceTime would be good examples. Talked about how email is an, an asynchronous thing um, for communication. Sorry. Um, however, the last one this is we had not talked about yet, which is forums, or also you might hear them called discussion boards. So participants can make postings on those, and then others can comment. All right, it sounds a little bit like Facebook, right? You put a post up, and other people can comment on how, how fun that was, or how idiotic that idea is, or whatever. However, forums are normally more for, uh, like, looking for help, all right, or at least often the ones that I go to. Um, you're like, my computer is a virus, and, you know, it's it's giving me this error, and I can type that error in, you know, you can go see what other people on the forums have said, or you might get someone from Microsoft who knows what the hell's going on and say, hey, yeah, this is what the, this is what that means, so you need to go uh, delete this file and tweak that and run this program, and you'll all be fine. And you do need to be a little bit careful um, when, you're, when you're dealing with forums, because you never know what the person's actually telling you to do. Um, it could be having you install software on your computer that you don't need, that's then going to give them remote access, that's like kind of the worst case scenario. Best case is they... They've perfectly directed you to the solution, and you can uh, just call it quits after that. So, But forums are huge right now. All right, and this leads us into Web 2.0. All right, so Web 2.0 is user-generated content. So it used to be that if you wanted to be on the Internet, you know, whenever you would go on the Internet, you would go on to companies' websites, right? That's where you got all the information, was from companies and other companies and other companies. And the Web 2.0 does still have those companies and news outlets and those types of things for information. However, it also has user-generated content, and YouTube is a great example of this, right? Um, there are millions or billions of people creating YouTube videos every day. This one's going to be a video, YouTube video, too. You might be watching it on there. Um, where people can post information for you to go find out stuff, all right? So, in this case, you know, this video is all going to be about Chapter 7 of Go All in One Textbook, right? Um, so, but user-generated content is, is absolutely key, and it's it's kind of like skyrocketed and made the internet this whole new really interesting thing where you and I are per se the owners of the internet now, not necessarily these large corporations. Now, obviously, we still do rely on large corporations for certain things, like you know Amazon for buying um, stuff, or you know, or Walmart for getting groceries delivered, or whatever website it is that you go with. But we also do have things like Etsy, which is a little small, like a, a website where small companies, if you want to have your own Etsy shop, you can, where you go on and sell things. So a lot of give and take is going on there. So, um, but, so we have our social media. So, so things like Facebook, um, Instagram, those types of things. Um, if you're looking for a more professional one, it's LinkedIn is the more professional social media. You do want to be very careful with things you post on social media because... Many of that stuff is public that anybody can view if you don't have your settings set up right, which is obviously a bad thing. So you do want to be kind of careful about that. All right. Um, and the other thing that I like always like to say is once something's digitized, it's rarely ever is completely gone. All right. Once you upload a picture to the Internet, it's it's out there. All right. It may be on your, your Google server, but it's probably still on Google server even after you deleted it. Um, and while Google will not let into other people access it, they're going to use, I think one of the things that you agree to when you upload photos is that they can look at your pictures and analyze them for whatever they want. So that way they can see what's going on. So kind of a, a really interesting long run. Uh, I think that Google also, I think um, oftentimes there's a check mark again that lets them read your in email so they can hopefully better tell you what they want to, uh, you know, uh, what you what type of response you might want to do. All right. Um, someone said that LinkedIn is now turning into Facebook. I I have a LinkedIn. I, I couldn't tell you the last time I actually accessed it. Probably the last time someone sent me a message on there was the last time I used LinkedIn. So, um, yeah, I want I want to come up with the next big social media platform. Man, I want to become rich just like everybody else. That'd be really nice. Um, so social media. Next we have avatars. All right, and you've, many of you have probably seen the movie Avatar or have made your own avatar. All right. But this is basically a virtual body. It's supposed to represent who you are, all right? Um, and, you know, they were all, they were originally developed for this wonderful Grandian scheme, so that way you would make something that would look like yourself or how you're feeling or whatever. And however, that may not be the case, right? Once you're on the internet, you become, uh, you know, no one knows you, you know? No one knows who you are, what you are, except for what you've posted. So, you know, you could be talking with someone who, you know, on a dating website who you think is this, this wonderful looking guy or girl, and you turn out real person, and you're like, oh, that's not what they looked at. Um, I have gone on a date with someone who I like this picture, and I'm like, oh, that girl looks pretty good looking. You get in the picture, and it's like, or not. 
Like, you know, looked at I looked at her pictures and man, she just picked the right pictures to post and you're like, okay. And then yeah, yeah. That that one uh that one's kinda ended up badly in my, in my opinion. But anyway. Um so your avatar may not match what you look like in the real world. If you have you guys have seen Ready Player One, you should probably know that the one person in the book, um, their avatar is a guy, and it turns out it's a girl who's the avatar, or the real world person. So a little, little give and take there. Um, avatars, they can change from day to day or, or environment to environment. So depending on what you're doing, your avatar may be changing. So again, something to keep a, keep a, a, a search for, a, a lock on. We do have tagging, which is the, the action of attaching a label to something, someone or something. Um, hashtagging is another wonderful example. Pound sign. Oh, I hate the word hashtag. Oh, I like pound like the pound sign. Why are we calling it a hashtag? I know. That's uh, probably whatever generation I am that thinks this is ridiculous, but that's fine. Um, so hashtags are one of those things that just, again, took off like a crazy person. We have blogs, which are online journals. We might hear them called what blogs? We blogs. So they're web pages that have tools able to post text and photographs. Now, blogs could be a private thing, which is only like you, you have to give someone access to, or it could be a very public thing where anybody can access it and, you know, give a little bit of give and take going on there. Um, so we also have microblogging, which enables you to post short comments online to update others on your activities and thoughts. So Twitter is a little microblog. All right, well, it used to be limited to like 200 characters or something like that. I think that number has grown popularity, but anyway. You have things like podcasts, which are typically a radio-like show. Um, this could be a pre-recorded or it could be live that you've tuned into. Um, and typically a podcast is going to be audio only, but not necessarily. There are video podcasts and things like that. We do have RSS, which is our really simple syndication. All right. I always like to show my, uh, my really simple syndication. Um, so I use what's called the old reader. All right, which allows me to keep track of a whole bunch of different websites. So anytime something gets posted on one of these websites, um, it gets thrown a little link to it with a little, oftentimes it's just a little section of it gets posted in my feed. So here's one from IDX um, on, from SUAS News about uh, Advanced Technical US Orbiter 4. And if I scroll down, here's another UAS one about a oh, oh, helicopter and man, a, lot of, a lot of UAS ones right now. Um, here's one from T-Mobile about Engadget. Gentip Max plan comes with true unlimited data. Now I'm curious. So anytime I come across something I'm like curious about, I can just click on it and I can read up about it, um, which is really a useful thing. So I, I always highly suggest that you guys start an RSS feed. I use the old reader. There are lots of different options out there for what you can use, um, but it allows you to like just grab random websites. So not all websites support it, but most do. So I have the Hackaday one, I have Engadget, I have some CNN stuff, I have Tested.com, Popular Science, Make, um, J. Rupert Law, NCAT stuff. So, you know, it gives me some news, some tech stuff. It gives me a nice wide variety all in one location. And anytime I find something interesting, I can then click on it to go read more. So, um, and this could be, and this is for keeping up with the frequently changing websites, blogs, and podcasts you enjoy. So highly suggest it. Next, we have on wikis, and I would say almost wiki, Wikipedia might be the thing that kind of truly overall kicked off the whole Web 2.0 thing. And this is where it relies on a crowdsourcing to develop the content, all right? So instead of, uh, you know, me having to be the one true knowledge subject on everything, uh, anybody can go post things on Wikipedia. Now, they do normally get fact-checked by people who, you know, who are fact-checkers and things like that. But it allows you to say, oh, this this little tidbit on this, this Wikipedia is wrong. You know, it's not the square root of pi r, it's the square of pi r or whatever you want to go with. Um, and it allows you to actually then go along and change that. And then someone else, depending on the wiki, may or may not have to then go and approve it. All right. So you, the user, can go on and edit that content as you seem fit to, and traditionally, again, it's to make it so it's correct. So something, again, really kind of interesting to look at. And the last thing with the Web 2.0, which is crowdfunding. And this this kicked off, again, big. All right? I wish I was the other person who kind of came up with this. Um, and the uh, big one is crowdfunding. Uh, what was that one? Man, I, I really can't think of it off the top of my head. Anyone know what's a big crowdfunding one? GoFundMe is one. Not the one I'm looking for. Yeah, anyway, there's some big, big names out there. Kickstarter, that's the one I was looking for. Um, so basically, you come up with your idea, 
you've developed your idea far enough or you're at the point where you're trying to like get manufacturing bread going. And oftentimes, if you, especially if you're trying to do large manufacturing runs, the cost can never that can be stupidly large. Getting all the, the injection molded parts and those metal pieces to inject the molds made and so much that goes into that that it's like, well, I can't afford this by myself. So you can go into crowdfunding and, you know, Kickstarter works on, you know, hey, if you support me, I, you know, I'll send you a final product once we can, you know, we get to that point. Is normally how, how Kickstarter works. However, it's not really how it's meant to work. It's meant to go, you think I have a really cool idea, here's a few bucks to help you support and get up and going with that type of thing. Um, and this is allowing us to go have, raise his money from, this is allowing you to raise money from multiple small investors rather than a few large investors. So you don't have to go to the bank to get a loan to get this going. Um, this also allows you to actually judge the need for it. So it allows you to say, Wow, there's twenty thousand people that actually think I have a cool idea. Where if you could go to the bank, you're kind of like, well, I think I think this is a good idea. I'm gonna go for it and uh, hope for the best. Okay. So really, kind of a, an interesting idea right there. So that's the Web 2.0. So Web 2.0. This is really where we're at, like kind of the world today. There's so much user generated content out there between blogs and wikis and YouTube and um, you know, just create your own websites. You can go to sites.google.com and you can make your own website through Google um, that allows you to post content and things like that. I've thought about doing it for all my teaching content instead of relying on um, D2L. I've thought about just posting a website out there so anybody can access it, use it, and whatever else. But overall, I decided it's better just to stick with LMS. It, make it makes everything easier and it keeps probably the higher ups happy. I realize just now that you guys can't see the whole crowdfunding thing. Um, but anyway, so Kickstarter is a great, great option there. So there's a lot going on in the web right nowadays, and it's not just from big corporations. There's a lot of little people putting their little two cents in here and there and allowing us all to really become the internet, not necessarily rely on everybody else to do everything. So that is the end of chapter seven. Do you guys?